Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is a podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I am very happy to be with you on this Tuesday following a three-day weekend. If you got to enjoy three days off from work, I hope you had a wonderful time. I actually did get to enjoy three days off, and um, I had... I had one of those weekends that was like the perfect combination of productive and lazy. I really like those, you know, when I feel like I actually get some stuff done that needs to be done. But I also had time to just, um, you know, lounge with my puppies and read and do some things and um, or not do some things as the case may be. But one of the things that I did accomplish over the weekend was an interview as um, I often do on weekends. And this time I spoke with Ed Rucker about his new book. It's called Justice Makes a Killing. It is a legal thriller and it is the second in his series. Um, The series uh, features a lawyer, a trial lawyer, a defense lawyer, excuse me, whose name is Bobby Earl, um, and the description of the book is this. When Bobby Earl meets the beautiful but vulnerable Kate Carlson, a prominent L.A. lawyer who awaits trial in a small-town jail for a murder during a prison break, he thinks he knows what's at stake. Negotiate a decent plea deal for a guilty client, pocket his fee, and move on. But Kate insists she's been set up. To find the truth, Bobby must risk his own life, career, and everything he loves by dredging up secrets of the billion-dollar prison industry and the powerful California Prison Guards Union in a desperate battle against a powerful and expanding conspiracy. So that is the description of uh, Justice Makes a Killing. As I mentioned, this is the second in the Bobby Earl series of books. The first one is called The Inevitable Witness, and then this one, as I said, is Justice Makes a Killing. And this, it's a legal thriller, so there's all kinds of um, plot twists and conspiracies and things that are going on. As you heard in the description, the, uh, the, the woman that Bobby Earl is defending is Kate Carlson, and she insists that she's been set up and... So as Bobby begins investigating this and trying to figure out how he is going to defend Kate in this instance, he just starts uncovering all of these different layers. And as the book goes on, those layers, he starts digging down more and finding more. Um, so you get you get the mystery part of that, but then you also get um, a pretty fascinating look at a high-profile trial uh, the, yes that rhymed a high profile trial but uh <laughs> and what it means to be a defense lawyer in a high profile trial and i found this fascinating because of course it's not like what you see on tv and i knew it wouldn't be like what you saw on tv but i don't have a lot of experience with actual trials high profile or not um i know that they are not going to be the same as on tv but that um truth is often you know more dramatic or stranger than fiction although this is fiction but um ed is a was a practicing defense lawyer for 40 years so he definitely knows what he's talking about when it comes to trials so you still have that high level of of drama and um, high stakes in this book, but you get a much more detailed and nuanced look at a trial. And, you know, when you watch on TV, they have to fit everything into a certain amount of time and they have to make it dramatic and and compelling so that you want to stay tuned, um, which is understandable. So you definitely get a deeper look in this book at a 
trial. So there's that aspect. There's the mystery aspect. There's the thriller aspect. Um, there's a couple of very sweet little dogs in the book. So, you know, I'm going to like that. <laughs> um, at any rate, it is a very interesting and compelling read. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, turn to the interview. Before we do that, though, I do have copies of Justice Makes a Killing to give away. So if you are interested in a copy of this legal thriller, stay tuned to the end of the podcast to find out how you can win a copy of Justice Makes a Killing by Ed Rucker. And now let's go ahead and turn to that interview with Ed. Hi, Ed. Welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, Sarah. It's great to be here. I am very happy to have you here. We are here to talk about your new book, Justice Makes a Killing. Before we get to the book, though, and the series, if you could uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself, that would be great. Well, I'm, uh, I have been a criminal defense lawyer my entire 40 years of career, and in that time I tried over 200 jury trials, uh, including 13 death penalty cases here in California, uh, to juries. Uh, I've uh, written a seven-volume work that's in its uh, fourth edition on criminal practice uh, and uh, uh, lectured extensively about it. So I have a a vast deal of experience in the trial of criminal cases. And now you are writing um, legal thriller, legal mysteries. Would you call them mysteries or thrillers? They're legal thrillers. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And um, it's a series. It's uh, the main character is Bobby Earl. So can you? This is the second book in the series. So can you? We'll, we'll start with the first book and just get a bit of an overview of of the series. Certainly. The first book, uh, The Inevitable Witness, uh, involves the story uh, of a case that Bobby Earl is, is uh, defending, and that is a legendary safecracker uh, who is charged with the murder of an undercover police officer. Uh, we follow the book through the viewpoint of Bobby Earl, the defense lawyer, as he investigates the case. It uh, culminates in a full jury trial, which hopefully gives the reader a view of what an authentic, high-profile, high-pressure murder trial is like. It's a death penalty case, so they get uh, a bit of a understanding of how uh, a death penalty case is tried. And I try and work in a couple social issues that I think uh, some vote or readers uh, seem to enjoy learning something uh, other than the, the actual mystery story itself. And that is, uh, I use the uh, professional informant system uh, as something to explore, that these are uh, informants that the prosecution routinely uses in cases who either uh, try and buy their freedom from a criminal charge that they're facing by either eliciting a confession or making one up. Uh, and it's uh, a practice that prosecutors use in both the federal and the state cases. Uh, it uh, results in uh, a significant number of innocent people being convicted, according to uh, the appellate records of people who have been released. Oh, wow. The second thing I, th I think is, is interesting for uh, the reader is the effect of the media has on the trial of cases. Uh, publicity uh, sort of puts all the participants in a pressure cooker. Uh, and in this book, uh, the media is embodied in uh, uh, an individual uh, who has a television show 
and uh, his nickname is The Thumb, uh, because he puts his thumb on the scales of justice uh, whenever a case is in the uh, light of publicity. Uh, and it uh, culminates in a full jury trial uh, that hopefully uh, gives the reader a opportunity to see how a real trial would unfold, which just in itself, high-pressure cases are high drama. And uh, it's, it's worth them exploring how uh, the rules of evidence, the uh, vagaries of witnesses, uh, and the skill of a cross examiner uh, might they might find interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, at least I hope so. <laughs> okay, so that's the first book. Uh, this one is the second book. It's called Justice Makes a Killing. Um, give a bit of an overview of this story. In in this case, Bobby Earl represents a uh, very prominent woman lawyer who's a. Uh, name partner in a very large, uh, prestigious law firm in Los Angeles. She's also the spokesperson for a voter initiative here in California to abolish the use of private prisons to incarcerate uh, individuals that have been sentenced by our courts. Uh, she's charged with uh, assisting an inmate at this private prison to escape. And in the attempted escape, uh, a prison guard is shot and killed, and the inmate himself is killed. Uh, the physical evidence against his client, Kate Carlson, uh, is overwhelming. And at first glance, it appears to be a case that's not defendable. But Kate tells him that not only is she innocent, but she's been framed. And as he investigates the case in preparation for trial, he finds two shadowy forces working against her, and that is the private prison industry, which is a billion-dollar industry in our country, uh, and the California Prison Guards Union, which is the most powerful lobbying force in California politics. Both these I, I have attempted to keep the facts in the case uh, scrupulously honest and accurate. Mm -hmm. the, the private prison industry has, has these prisons in almost every state and in uh, a number of countries around the world. It's a billion-dollar industry, and it's operated on the for-profit model in which they'll build the prison. There are eight in the state of California, for example, and uh, they will sign a contract with the state to house inmates at their private prisons. And they make a profit on that by not wasting, quote unquote, uh, any money on rehabilitation or efforts to allow these inmates to become accepted uh, contributing members of society when they are released. There's no drug programs, there's no educational programs. They, they are just warehouses. In fact, they're paid on a per diem basis for each day an inmate is in the prison. It, it's run like a hotel. Uh, the, the second issue, which is factually based, is that the California uh, Prison Guards Union uh, is uh, correct. Part of their dues go into uh, campaign uh, contributions to politicians who set their salaries. 
So now the guards in California, uh, with their very routine overtime pay, uh, earn more than an assistant professor with a Ph.D. at the University of California. Uh, they also were responsible, the union was also responsible for starting this mass incarceration uh, campaign that is that spread around the country about 15, 20 years ago. Uh, they were the original sponsor of the Three Strikes Law, uh, which uh, retired Supreme Court Justice Kennedy uh, in a speech at Pepperdine University said that their sponsorship was, quote, sick. Uh, and the reason they did that was that the longer and longer sentences result in inmates being retained in prison for a longer period of time. Therefore, when a new inmate is sentenced there, the prison gets overcrowded to the point where the, the, the U.S. Supreme Court said that California prisons uh, violate the cruel and unusual punishment clause of the Constitution. Hmm. Uh, so the, the result when California had, had the money, they would build more prisons. We went from 10 prisons to 32. Wow. And, and that still didn't solve it because they kept getting uh, the legislation to increase the length of punishment. Didn't, didn't create new crimes. You couldn't create really uh, new crimes. But instead of serving five years, they'll serve 15. Mm -hmm. Or they'll serve life. We have a lot of life inmates. Uh, and so they had to turn to the private prisons because they couldn't afford to build more prisons. And uh, so it's a symbiotic relationship between the union and the private prison industry to house these people. Okay. So it it uh, it, it hopefully it, this is woke. I've woven this into the story. It's not a pedantic. I've just been explaining it in a sort of a lecture form. Uh, it's not a pedantic. Uh, recitation in the book. It just comes out in the story itself. Right, right. All right, so I'm going to jump in here and we're going to take our first break of the podcast, but you've gotten an idea of what this story is about and some of the context with the uh, prison guard union and why Kate is saying that she has been framed and kind of the stakes that are in play here. So uh, we are going to take our first break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be talking more about Justice Makes a Killing with Ed Rucker. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Want to find out what movies to go see? Then check out the GSMC Movie Podcast. It's your ticket to the latest movies, whether it's a new blockbuster event, romantic, comedy, or action flick. This show has got it all covered. They talk some what to go see now. Don't bother. What's hot on Netflix and everything in between? That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash movie dash podcast. When it's all about the movies, it has to be this new show. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Before the break, Ed was speaking about the uh, some of the context for the story in Justice Makes a Killing. He was talking about the prison guard union and some of the reasons that Kate feels she has been framed uh, or insists that she has been framed. She doesn't feel it. She knows that she's been framed um, and insists that she has. So let's go ahead and get back to that interview with Ed. So was the private prison industry um, kind of your inspiration for this book, or did you start somewhere else and then weave that aspect into it? Uh, well, it, it, it was... 
I, I was astounded that no one was really aware of this at the time. It's now gotten some more uh, publicity uh, because uh, three out of every four immigrants who are uh, arrested for crossing the border are now housed in a private prison mm -hmm. in, uh, in America. Uh, but uh, the story itself is, is the, the, the main inspiration for the book. Uh, I, hopefully it's, it's a story that would uh, entertain a reader, uh, and the weaving in of the private prisons and the union guards are just something that, on the side, uh, hopefully it'll be uh, interesting for them to learn about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so let's talk a little bit more about Bobby Earl as the main character, the protagonist. What about him do you think might resonate with readers? Well, first of all, he's an authentic depiction of a criminal defense lawyer. Uh, he's, he is the opposite of what uh, the reader may see uh, on Law and Order on television, for example, where oftentimes the defense lawyer is depicted as a mere extension of uh, the, the criminal that they're representing. Uh, they're uh, depicted as dishonest, uh, sort of uh, shabby, uh, characters. Uh, uh, he's a dedicated uh, professional uh, who uh, fights hard for his clients. And he is a brilliant trial lawyer, so that as this book unfolds, it uh, culminates in a full jury trial. Uh, and hopefully the reader can see through his viewpoint, some of the strengths and weaknesses of our criminal justice system, and uh, what it's the impact of real rules of evidence on presenting the case for someone who he learns is innocent, uh, and the skill required to cross-examine witnesses uh, and bring out uh, the truth from people who uh, would rather gargle battery acid than, than admit some of these facts. Uh, and it, it shows the, the great uh, sort of dilemma that uh, a dedicated criminal defense lawyer has uh, in trying to have uh, somewhat balanced life. Uh, he has a girlfriend uh, named Sam, uh, Samantha, who uh, is a uh, deputy district attorney here in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And uh, his uh, focus on uh, representing his client and the time and the uh, loss of a sleep uh, over worry uh, that he has uh, makes it difficult to balance his life uh, with Sam. Uh, and also the fact that we touch on that the attitude of uh, prosecutors now is that rather than both the defense lawyer and the prosecutors are professionals who try a case by a, a set of rules, uh, compete uh, fiercely against each other, but uh, don't take things personally, has changed. Uh, it's more of a tribal attitude. And so Sam, being a prosecutor, her colleagues in the office, uh, when they learn of her relationship with Bobby Earl, uh, feel somehow that she is compromised and uh, might share office uh, information with him or do something unethical. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that's another obstacle to them. Right. But, but they bond a bit because she has a dog who uh, uh, sort of a, a 
a uh, dog with a, a permanent uh, bad hair day and, <laughs> and scraggly teeth, who Aww. she's named Beauty. Beauty. I was just going to say, but... <laughs> and Bobby has a, a hound dog who uh, is unfortunately named Henceforth <laughs> yes. because he, he took great pride in trying to come up with when he first got the dog, uh, an appropriate name. So each night he would come home with a different name and say, henceforth your name will be, you know, X, Y, or Z. And finally, after a week, the only name he would respond to was henceforth. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So he finds a way to involve himself uh, in various aspects of the case. Yes, and I loved that. I loved the story about henceforth's name. It made me, it made me laugh. Yeah, um, yeah, he's a character. Yes, he's a real character. Yes. Um, so, you, a lot of this, I'm sure, is from your own experience because you did spend 40 years as a trial lawyer. Um, did you do specific research for the book? Uh, I did research on the uh, prison guards union. And I did research on private prisons, but the uh, you know the old adage that you write about what you know, and and uh, I know uh, jury trials. Uh, uh, by that I don't mean uh, I'm an expert on every aspect of a jury trial. No, no defense lawyer really is. Uh, but I I've tried enough. I've known enough. Uh, defense lawyers and prosecutors and judges and uh, over the years. And so the, the case when it culminates in a full jury trial uh, will uh, hopefully reflect an authentic view of what a trial is like, not in some kind of uh, pedantic way, but through the actual story of this woman and how you have to uh, attempt to skirt the rules of evidence uh, to get in your evidence, how the prosecutor can use it on the other side to get in her evidence. Uh, And so hopefully a a jury will get a different view of what a real trial uh, consists of. And real trials at that level, uh, where someone's life is on the line, Mm-hmm. is high drama. Mm-hmm. And it's definitely different. I mean, as you said earlier, you know, like shows like like Law & Order or shows that depict trial, they have to fit everything into an hour with commercials. <laughs> so you definitely get right. a much more detailed, nuanced look at how this process works. And um, it's it's very different than watching it on, on a, a TV drama. Yes, uh, in... in for example, law and order, uh, they, uh, the lawyer will, in the form of a question, recite uh, their theory of the case or the motivation of this particular uh, witness without any evidence to support it. Uh, there'll be an objection, and then they'll just say, withdrawn. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they're, they're sort of telling their side of the case without having to uh, elicit the facts from witnesses. And that's the real challenge in a trial. And the judge Uh, in your book does not let her lawyers get away with that. (laughs) No. uh, (laughs) I I noticed that, yes. The the profession of, of criminal defense lawyers prosecutors and judges and police officers, uh, by uh, the the vast majority of which are extremely ethical and uh, try and stay within the bounds of their role. Uh, But the pressure of the case and the need to win on both sides and the need to need to solve the crime right away by the police, and the need of a judge 
when this is a publicity case, not to appear too soft on crime or to uh, be biased on the side of the defense, results in some of the participants breaking the rules. Uh, and by breaking the rules, I mean, for example, a prosecutor may not turn over evidence that points to innocence when they discover it because it's like handing an advantage to the other side which runs against their competitive instinct. Uh, and the danger of that isn't just, oh, gee, they broke the rule. It's that the rule is there to prevent innocent people from being convicted, and it is not uh, a, a fantasy or a, a construction out of uh, a whole cloth to say that prosecutors do that. Uh, the, the, uh, the papers you'll see of someone being released from prison after 30 years uh, when they've discovered uh, evidence that the prosecution had that proves not only they're innocent but points to the real culprit, uh, which as a result, the real corporate culprit can go on and commit other crimes. Uh, now, I've, I've had some cases, not, not many, but some, where that's happened, that uh, uh, prosecutors have, have hidden evidence. Uh, so examples of that are not uh, just created for drama. They, they're based on, on reality. Mm-hmm. Let me jump in here once again so we can take our second break of the podcast when we come back more with Ed on his new book, Justice Makes a Killing. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with Ed Rucker about the newest in his Bobby Earl series, Justice Makes a Killing. Let's go ahead and get back to that interview. You mentioned earlier, you know, you, you write what you know. Um, how much would you say of you is in Bobby, the character? Uh, well, it's not based on me because... For some amazing coincidence, Bobby Earl wins all his cases. <laughs> uh, and uh, any good defense lawyer uh, is going to try cases uh, for, for good reasons uh, that he might lose. Either the case is overwhelming or it is a real close case, and to accept the plea bargain for someone who might very well be innocent uh, is not what a lawyer should do, mm -hmm. and uh, so it, it's, it's difficult. I, I was fortunate that in 40 years uh, that happened to me only once, uh, in my view. Mm -hmm. uh, that the person should not have been convicted. Uh, but uh, uh, 
Bobby, your old doesn't have that experience. Right. Right. Okay. So, but it's not based. It's not based on me. Right. Uh, and uh, it is based on a uh, accumulation of traits of other defense lawyers I've seen. Mm-hmm. Now the now the the conduct of uh, cross examination, investigation, opening and closing arguments dealing with the judge are all things that I have experienced uh, and I have seen other lawyers uh, practice in that fashion. So it's an accumulation of my experience and my observations of others. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is, uh, as we've said, a series. Do you have... um an image in your head of how many books you would like, or are you just going to keep writing as long as Bobby has stories to tell you? Yeah, I, I, I have another one in, I don't know how, <laughs> how, how many, because it, it's, I, 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 I don't want to just uh, turn out something. I'd like to turn out something I'm proud of. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, uh, noodling around, uh, Another one that that uh, deals back in the, the history of uh, uh, Los Angeles uh, back in the seventies uh, around the oil industry, uh, because uh, California has this impression or a public image that uh, people are attracted to it because of the weather and uh, perhaps. Uh, the, the movie industry or uh, the great agricultural uh, industry we have. But the real attraction that built California was the oil industry. At, at one point, uh, California provided 25% of all the oil in the United States. Hmm. And currently, today, uh, Los Angeles City, has 3,000 active oil rigs oh, wow. working it in the city itself. So it's, it, it's, it's an interesting aspect, once again, of something that people might not be aware of, that if you can weave it into a good story uh, without just uh, laying it out, but have it uh, emerge from the story itself, uh, uh, might be interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, you... Uh, you know, you you were a lawyer, so I know you wrote a lot in that profession. You said you have the seven-volume um, work that you did. What made you decide to turn to writing fiction? Uh, it's something I've always wanted to do. Uh, I just, uh, parenthetically, uh, when I started my career out of law school, I joined the Los Angeles Public Defender's Office, uh, and uh, it's the way most uh, really experienced criminal defense lawyers start off. You learn your skills because uh, you are just thrown in and try case after case after case. Uh, And after several years there, I took an administrative position. I was uh, a head deputy, uh, which uh, freed up my my nights. Uh, I didn't have to worry about personally worry on a on a case uh, as I did when I was trying cases. Uh, so I could write, and I uh, many years ago wrote uh, a legal thriller. Uh, this was long before. Uh, any of the current practitioners, such as uh, Patterson or uh, any of them, had started to write. And I got an agent in New York. Uh, he sent it to a very good uh, house, a publishing house in, in New York. Uh, they, they liked it. They wanted me to change the ending. And at that point, 
in my career, I left the public defender's office, uh, married, had two kids, and had to make a living, uh, and I got very busy. Uh, but I thought, well, this is easy. I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll come back to this when I have a little time. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but the genre uh, got uh, very crowded in the in the, in the interim. Uh, uh, so uh, here I am. Now I have the time. Uh, I'm giving it another shot. Okay. And um, do you have advice for aspiring authors? Uh, yeah. One one tip that that uh, I have found. Uh, very helpful uh, that uh, when you you know you do your draft you do your rewrites your rewrites your rewrites uh, I think speaking out loud particularly the dialogue of people rather than just reading it on the page to yourself sort of uh, hits your ear, uh, whether it is uh, sounds true to life or not. It's, it's interesting because when you read it on the page, oh, that's a good use of words. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you've turned a phrase there. Uh, good for you. Uh, but if you read it out loud, it doesn't roll off the tongue if it doesn't just come out spontaneously to you, somehow your ear catches it. Uh, so that would be something I, I would advise, mm-hmm. that you you somehow read out loud uh, some of your passages. Okay. And, and as far as thrillers are concerned, I have to chart them out. Uh, I try and chart out each scene uh, before I start writing to uh, color code when you will you will uh, slip in a clue where you will put in something that would support a an action later on in the story so that it all moves sort of like a wave and naturally uh, when the reader hopefully gets to that point, oh, well, that, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I understood. Mm-hmm. You know, I missed that one. Oh, yeah. Okay. So those are the two things I would suggest. All right. When you take the time to read for yourself, what do you like to read? Do you have favorite authors or genres? I, I do read uh, mysteries, but Recently, I've been trying to read uh, some authors who are real uh, masters of telling stories, uh, such as uh, Flannery O'Connor and Wallace Stegner, who are short story writers and and wonderful storytellers, uh, trying to get... Uh, the skill, the craft of doing that. And as far as uh, the wonderful language that some authors have, I, I really like William Faulkner and Sebastian Barry, who's an Irish uh, writer. Uh, they're wonderful wordsmiths. All right. Thank you. Do you have a website? Uh, I really don't. Okay. Uh, Unfortunately, I'm old school. <laughs> okay. Um, so if people want information on the book and they want they want to look on the Internet, where would they go? Well, uh, it's, it's uh, the book's available at your local independent bookstore, which I think we should all encourage. It's available on Amazon. You click in my name, Ed Rucker. Uh, both books will will pop up with some description of the books and uh, some background about me. Uh, so they're, they're widely available. 
Okay. And do you have any social media? I'm not a Facebook guy. So. <laughs> okay. Not a problem. Just uh, just double checking. Um, sure. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you would like to touch on at this point? Uh, well, uh, it, it hopefully the reader of the books will see that the role of a defense lawyer is absolutely essential for our democracy. Uh, it's oftentimes depicted that defense lawyers trying to get off a, a guilty person. Mm -hmm. What the defense lawyer is designed for in our criminal justice system, the role that he plays is that when the state brings charges against a person, now this is an extremely powerful act that as a society we're going to do. We're telling this person, you're guilty of this and we're going to lock you away. And it is also a system that in many countries is manipulated in such a way that many innocent people and many political dissidents are punished. And in our system, with an active defense bar, they make sure that the evidence that the state brings against a person to lock them up is enough. If we don't have uh, diligent defense lawyers who don't fight and make the state prove their case, Slowly, the bar or amount of evidence necessary to lock somebody out starts slipping and slipping down so that uh, in, in uh, the, the most horrible situation, it would be the state says they're guilty and off they go with a five-minute trial. Uh, so people should understand the, the, the purpose of a defense lawyer. Uh, and uh, that's something hopefully they'll see uh, through the books. Okay. Well, thank you for that, and thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me about the Bobby Earl series and specifically Justice Makes a Killing. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Sarah. I've enjoyed it. <laughs> thank you again to Ed for taking the time to talk to me this weekend and for being very patient with some technical difficulties that we had throughout the process. I so appreciate it when I get uh, patient and flexible authors who uh, are willing to work with me when things do not go quite as planned. So thank you, Ed, for the interview. Thank you for your patience. And thank you for uh, the stories that you have written. If you are interested in reading a copy of Justice Makes a Killing, you can enter to win that copy. All you have to do is go to our um, social media pages, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, GSMC Book Review, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, and uh, comment on this episode. It is episode 177, Interview with Ed Rucker. That's it. Just go and comment on episode 177 on either Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, GSMC Book Review, and you will be entered to win a copy of Justice Makes a Killing. So you should definitely take advantage of that, especially if you're a fan of um, this genre. I hope that you, again, had a wonderful weekend. Hope that you uh, spent it doing exactly what you wanted to do and that so far your week is going well, that your Tuesday was not too Monday-ish. Thank you so much, as always, for joining me for the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I hope you will join me again next time to talk more about books, etc. In the meantime, have a wonderful week and uh, take some time to get lost in a good book. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. 
from movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.